Wisteria. Energy. 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 Twist. Hi everybody, welcome back to The Ghosts of Essex. This is called Two Cunning Men and Some Witches, surprisingly. If you had lived in Hadley in the first half of the year, the 19th century that is, you had a serious problem, who could you turn to for help? Perhaps your livestock was mysteriously ailing. A member of your family took a comical with strange hyster- hysterical fits which made everyone shake their heads and mutter, Witchcraft, witchcraft, witchcraft. Or perhaps your true lover proved faithless. There's only one answer. Sooner or later you'd be knocking on the door of a small clapboarded cottage where the daunting cry, I am the devil's master, told the nervous supplicant, that James Murrow, the cunning man, was at home, inside, in a little room, festooned with bunches of herbs hung up to dry, and littered with books and mysterious charge, charts that were charged with crystals. There he'd be, a thin, slight figure, no taller than five feet high, wearing his threadbare old blue frock, coat, with the brass buttons in his sharp blue eyes, glittering in the firelight as he keenly eyed his visitor through his iron-rimmed spectacles. In those isolated and superstitious um, county areas, let's say, no one questioned the power and authority of cunning Murrow. He was regarded with respect, bordering on fear. And in his home village of Hadley, and in Canaldon, to the northeast, stories about him were remembered for many years after his death in 1860. A book, A Cunning Man, Cunning Murrow, by Arthur Morrison, published in 1900s, is described on the title page as a tale of witchcraft and smuggling. Mm, but. The subject today, in fact, well, we would call it a faction, as Morrison collected many a curious story of Murrell and his mysterious activities to use in his novel. When Morrison visited Hadley just 25 years after Murrell's death, he was in time to talk to Murrell's youngest son, Edward, known as Book as well as the blacksmith who once made Murrell's famous iron witch bottles. In his youth, Murrell had worked for a London chemist, actually called a chemist, but a chemist nonetheless, where he acquired a useful knowledge of pharmacy, and he understood the value of different herbs and natural cures. He had an old box where he hoarded his precious books and papers. There were ancient medical volumes, a cool pe- pepper herbal, books on astronomy, astrology, conjuration, geomancy, all well thumbed and grimy, and a curious volume by a 17th century wizard called Neobod. This contained arcane knowledge on charms, spells, together with old horoscopes. To this, Merle had added in tiny handwriting, his own notes, including an horoscope for Queen Victoria. It was these treasures that people want to go to the South Church Hall Museum to see. They go to it there at South End and hope to get a glimpse. There's a medieval carved wooden chest on view which belonged to Murrow. And maybe you're lucky enough to go there yourself and see it one day. The heart of books, papers, letters. Um, well, Morrison was lucky enough to see them, but apparently they were burnt a long time ago by some member of the Murrell family, and that's a really big shame. In an article by Arthur Morrison published in The Strand magazine in 1900, he related the stories local people in Hadley and Camelden had told him about Murrell's amazing powers. 
He could do anything, cure anything, know anything, past, present and future. They declared, and 40 years after his death at the age of 80, his reputation as a white wizard was undiminished. Whether it was a simple matter of lost property or the defeat of some wicked neighbourhood witch, this remarkable seventh son of a seventh son was the man local people could consult with confidence. Some even whispered that he could fly through the air. Mm. He could be in several places all at once. And he had a penetrating glass with which he could look through walls. Although those who said it was all done with mirrors maybe knew a thing or two. Not surprisingly, as some of his cases were so extraordinary that they've never been forgotten. There was Sarah Mott of High Street Hadley, cursed by witchcraft, so that she ran round in circles without stopping, and walked upside down on the ceiling like a blue bottle. Among the papers found after Merrill's death were full details of the charms and other methods he used to effect a cure. A friend of Merrill's who had had a confrontation with a witch and feared retribution was told by the old wizard to follow her over the heath where she lived and stick a knife into her footprints. Something that I actually am aware of doing and I've seen it done. When the man did this, the witch cried out in pain and hopped all the way home. The vital item in defeating the machinations of witches and lifting spells was an iron bottle made for Merle by the local blacksmith. Into it went blood, nail clippings and snippets of hair from the victim, pins, horse nails and some of Merle's special herbs, just like my grandma used to do, I'm just saying. This mixture was eaten up in the fire of the victim's house, in the belief that, as the contents of the witch bottle boiled, the witch herself would feel burning until the spell was lifted. One day the victim was a Hadley girl who had fallen foul of an old gypsy whom she found stealing beer. She sent the old woman packing, but almost immediately started screaming like a cat and barking like a dog as she ran round on all fours. Well, that would have been a sight. As Merle conducted his witch bottle ceremony, someone was heard coming up the path and a voice cried, Stop! Stop! You're killing me! At that moment, the bottle exploded and the victim was cured. But the body of the old gypsy woman was discovered, half burned, lying in the road. Merle himself died on the day he prophesied. 16th of December, 1860, he was buried on the east side of the little Norman church in Hadley with his wife, who predeceased him in 1839, and some of his 14 children, and his memory is still as green as the unmarked grassy mounds in that traffic-bound oasis. His reputation was so powerful, far beyond the isolated little village where he lived, that local people must have found it hard to believe that cunning Merle had gone on at last. Indeed, for years after his death, they say a familiar small figure in an old blue frock coat and hard-glazed black hat like sailors used to wear was sometimes seen as the light was fading, gathering herbs from the hedgerows and putting them in frail basket, hanging from the handle of an old gingham umbrella. Merle always said, there will be witches in Leon Sea for a hundred years, and three in Hadley, and nine in Camwoodham forever. A Canadian, or Canewoodan, it is pronounced in different ways. And its own famous cunning man in The Master of Witches, George Pickingill. There is a photograph of him standing outside his cottage door in his shabby old coat, 
tall black hat in hand with an expression of such malevolence that one can readily believe that a glance from his icy blue eyes sent shivers down the spine of any villager. He was said to have such power over the local witches that he had only to stand at his door and whistle and they all came running and he inspired such fear in the village that no one ever refused to do his bidding, lest he bewitch them. Pickingle's evil eye was believed to have the power to stop machinery, and it was said that old Picky would order his team of familiars or imps to mow a field at great speed while he sat smoking and drinking his beer. For some people avoided passing his cottage by the anchoring at night, as they said, they saw lots of little red eyes staring at them. Were these his imps? Or were they just the pet mice he kept? Hmm. Like Merle, picking girl, lived to a ripe old age, and dying at 93 in 1909. He went out with a flourish as well, promising to give everyone something to remember him by at his funeral. And sure enough, when the hearse drew up at the churchyard, the two horses drawing it stepped out of the shafts and galloped away. Camden means Hill of Canna's people and commemorates Canute's landing there with his Danish army to do battle with Edmund Ironside for the throne of England. The tower of the ancient church of St Nicholas is believed to have been built by Henry V to celebrate Agincourt a tower tall enough to have been used as a beacon for ships at sea, and from which there is a marvellous view of around a hundred square miles of Essex. But Camden's fame is in its connections with witchcraft. Eric Maple, who spent more than a year in the late fifties collecting the witch lore of Camden, wrote, There is perhaps no place in the British Isles where the belief in witchcraft survived as long as so late, and where legends of old dark magic were told only a generation ago in the chimney corner. Little wonder that this district has always been known, and still is, the Witch County. It's said that every time a stone falls from the church tower a witch dies to be replaced by another. The churchyard itself has long been haunted by a ghost, believed to be a 17th century witch who was considered to be condemned and executed. She leaves the churchyard by the west gate, and goes downhill to the river, sometimes travelling rapidly on a hurdle. She's also been seen by crossroads and by the village pond. One man described her floating above the road, wearing a crinoline and poke bonnet, and as she reached him, he was violently thrown to the ground. She was seen several times during the last war, when this malevolent spook would suddenly appear behind people and knock them down. As some say she has no head. Others say that, under her poke bonnet, she has no face. One young man riding his motorbike on Larkill Road in Camden encountered a luminous figure standing just in the middle of the road. The head was shrouded in mist, and he was convinced that he had seen the witch ghost from Camden Churchyard. And one night, the landlord of Plough and Sale Pub in Pilsham was driving home through Camden when something black with staring eyes loomed up out of the darkness in front of his car. There is only one way to describe what I saw, he said. It was a witch. Halloween has become a night for would-be ghost hunters to cover all the different happenings and paranormal stuff, maybe get a glimpse of something. The churchyard has many other ghosts, a crusader, another female wraith, both reputed to leave their graves to wander the area at times. There's another local legend that if you run three times round the church at midnight in an anti-clockwise direction, you can go back in time. However, of late, police have prevented crowds approaching too close to the church, especially at Halloween, and much to the relief of local residents. 
but the village's reputation for supernatural happenings persists. The South End Standard of 30th of May 1963 reported that the wife of the then vicar had several times seen the ghost of a young girl standing in her driveway and doors in the vicarage often opened of their own accord. Is witchcraft still alive and well in Camelton? There are people who believe that the old black arts are far from dead even today. After all, an ancient tradition says that as long as the tower of St. Nicholas Church stands, there will be witches in Camden. And there it still stands, just as it has for centuries in the heart of the witch county. The end. And I can show you Yes, there are still real witches. Not many about like they used to be. But they are still out there. That's a fact. I know this for a fact. Anyway, guys, thank you for listening. If you're on YouTube, please hit that like, share if you can, and consider subscribing. Many blessings. Wisteria, Wisteria. Energy. 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 Twister. 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 Twister.